First of all, welcome everyone to our second uh, webinar this year in, in a series of webinars. Um, if you joined us for the last one, we had, that was a, an introductory topic to virtual online English language training for aviation personnel. And today, wherever you are in the world, we're continuing that theme with, we're really privileged to have three speakers with us. Um, Jennifer Roberts, uh, who is also a board member. And we've got Alan Orr and Gina Lynch uh, from Embry-Riddle. Uh, I'll hand you over to Jennifer in, in a minute, but just before we, we start, can I make a request that you, you, if you know how to, if you're familiar with Zoom, is you add a little bit of information to your name. So if you right click on your name, you can rename yourself. Now we don't want to do that, of course, but if you could add a little bit of information about your, your background. So if you're an aviation English teacher or a, a rater perhaps, or a pilot or a controller, whatever it might be, just a little bit of a, a tag next to your name. So we can, we can quickly during the, the webinar, see who's who. If you're not familiar with that, don't, don't worry too much, but it's, it's a right click on your name. Okay, I'm going to hand you over to, to Jennifer, who's going to, to start, and um, we'll make a start now. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, just a couple other quick things. Uh, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, uh, please feel free to write your questions in the chat box. We do have a chat moderator who is going to compile all the questions and he'll give those to me at the end uh, so we can answer as many of your questions as we're able. Um, if there are any that we can't answer, we'll make sure to answer those and disseminate by email. Uh, further, you know, right now, if you want to, feel free to turn off your video. Uh, the first part of this webinar will be presentation from us, and we will move into a breakout room in which you'll be free, and we will welcome you to turn your video uh, back on. Uh, so thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever it is for you. Uh, we are here to talk to you. You can see the title here about rerouting aviation English. So some strategies for teaching online. This maybe like us was a new reality for you. So we want to just give you some tips, some tools, some ideas about how you might do this. Uh, you can see our names here. Uh, Gina Lynch, Alan Orr, and myself, Jennifer Roberts. Uh, before we go too much into the webinar, I do want to introduce us to you just briefly. Uh, we do all work at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, so you can see a lovely picture of our university there. That's our new student center. Uh, unfortunately, we, we are not there right now, but it is a lovely campus. We hope that you'll have time to visit us, and perhaps you did visit us. Uh, we hosted the IKEA conference, uh, I think, two years ago in 2018. Uh, so perhaps some of you in this photo at the bottom are here today in the webinar. Uh, just briefly, some information about us. We do all work as aviation English specialists at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. We all have master's degrees in applied linguistics or TESOL and somehow landed into this field of aviation English uh, in the past five or six years. Um, our job is mostly to develop programs, courses, and assessment tools. We do this for a variety of students that are in the industry. Uh, we focus a lot on ab initio flight training because that's what we do at Embry-Riddle. We do flight training, so that's very relevant and close to home for us. Uh, but we also develop and teach for licensed air traffic controllers, commercial airline pilots, as well as we've done some teacher training. Uh, the other nice thing is that we all actually work for the worldwide campus of Embry-Riddle. So we've been lucky to get a lot of experience in developing not only classroom courses, but also online courses. Embry-Riddle Worldwide is known for their online modality of teaching. So we've learned a lot and that's kind of what we're here to share with you today. 
the webinar outline, uh, you can just see here the five parts. You'll hear from me about this concept of flipping the classroom. And then my colleague, Alan, will talk to you about some platforms, materials, and tools to do that flipping of the classroom. And then you will see the ideas put into practice with uh, my other colleague, Gina Lynch. Uh, we will invite you to join us in some breakout rooms. I hope that everyone did their homework. Uh, we sent it out via email, and I think also when you register to watch a video of the TAM 8078 incident involving a landing gear malfunction. And then we'll just briefly wrap up. So to get started with uh, my part here, I just want to talk to you about this concept of flipping the classroom. This may be something that you've heard of. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as blended learning or even hybrid uh, learning, hybrid teaching, things like that. So. Essentially, what it is is a combination of synchronous and asynchronous sessions. And you'll hear us refer to, to learning and teaching a lot in this session as synchronous or asynchronous. So just to be clear, kind of the difference between the two, uh, it's pretty simple, but synchronous sessions are teacher-led sessions. These happen in the same place at the same time. Uh, so essentially right now we are having a synchronous session because everyone is logged in at the same time. Although you are admittedly in different places geographically, we are all together in the same place in online in this Zoom platform. So I am in a sense your teacher and I am leading right now this synchronous session. Uh, contrasted to that is an asynchronous session in which the students would be learning independently. So you maybe sent your students home with some kind of assignment or you've given them a link to do something online uh, on their own time. So that's why we say here asynchronous learning is happening in different places and also at different times. In this webinar today, we are going to focus mostly on the asynchronous portion of the blended learning. So we want to give you some ideas for things that you can do to kind of set your students up asynchronously to participate in the synchronous session that you may have with your students later. So some ideas for things that students can do at home on their own time to get ready or to support the synchronous sessions that you will have with them. So just to kind of put this in a framework that we are all familiar with, uh, as teachers, a lot of us learn about the communicative method, communicative language teaching, and we frame it with, <coughs> excuse me, this PPP, right? So present, practice, and then produce. And so to put that in the context of asynchronous and synchronous, I've just put here some suggestions for how you might accomplish these parts of the communicative method using asynchronous or synchronous sessions. So again, though, oh, sorry, backwards. We have to think about if we're going to be doing these asynchronous sessions without a teacher, you know, what does that mean, right? What, what are the considerations for us to do presentation of material or even practicing of material without a teacher? I did put here that you can also have some production asynchronously, uh, re perhaps recorded. And I believe later on, Alan will talk a little bit about some platforms where that may be possible. But if you consider how am I going to actually do the teaching or how are the students going to do the practicing, you know, if I'm not there. We have to remember that in this case, the learning environment will, of course, be either online or in the student's home, not in the traditional classroom. Uh, further, you as the teacher, you won't be able to monitor their participation or their progress, right, as you are not present. In the same way, there's no opportunity for any spontaneous interaction or questions. You know, the student cannot raise their hand and let you know that they don't understand. Perhaps they can send you an email, but of course there will be some delay between the asking of the question and you being able to answer it. So in that regard, it is very important that the materials that we provide to the students to do asynchronous learning, that they are able to quote unquote teach on their own. Right, the, the materials must do the teaching for you. There are some benefits of asynchronous learning that I want to go over. First of all is, of course, the flexibility. You know, so especially for a lot of us who work with working professionals, you know, professional pilots, air traffic controllers, they may not necessarily appreciate being told that you have to be in class, you know, in the evening at 630 every day. It may be better for them to have a bit of flexibility of when they complete their assignments. 
A further, of course, we have a larger geographical reach in this way. So especially if you are able to create uh, even a, a purely asynchronous course, right? You have the ability really to reach students all over the world at one point. Many of the materials that you might create for asynchronous learning can actually be recycled and used in other modalities. This is something that we've experimented with a lot. Uh, we've transitioned some courses and materials lessons that we use in the classroom into asynchronous learning and we can also translate them back the other way. Uh, Gina will talk about that later today in the webinar. And the last one, which is a very important one, is that we believe that asynchronous learning helps to build autonomous language learners. Uh, you have your students there at home. They don't have the crutch of the teacher to just raise their hand and ask a question when they don't understand. So we can also build in them strategies for their own language learning. You know, what do you do when you don't understand a word, right? What do you do when you don't understand the lesson, right? We can start to build some autonomous language learners, which is a great strategy for students moving forward. And finally, of course, though, we do want to acknowledge that there are some major challenges of asynchronous learning and also hopefully give you some tips to overcome those challenges today. But one of the biggest challenges is, of course, the teacher workload. Um, it will fall onto the teacher to set up this central platform that's necessary to host materials, to communicate with uh, your students. And this will really kind of be the foundation for your course. And it does take some time up front to set this up. And then, of course, because students are doing more assignments and then maybe having to turn them in so that you can see that they've been done or to give to check and give feedback, there's a potential increase in grading. The second is, of course, the student workload. Uh, so, you know, I myself actually am doing now another master's degree in human factors and I'm doing it online all asynchronously. And I will admit that as a student, I may not be as good at this as I am a teacher. Uh, so I also struggle with being motivated and self-disciplined, especially after a full day of working and then you need to, you know, pop on the internet and do your homework. It's not exactly, uh, not always easy. So as teachers, it's important for us to be aware of that as well. And then lastly is, of course, the materials and the tools. So we believe that if you have good materials, good tools, then maybe that second bullet about the student workload, you know, that can kind of alleviate that. If your materials and what you're teaching is so interesting that the students don't necessarily mind or they're very engaged, then you don't have so much to worry about the student workload issue. But again, remember that in this situation, because students are learning at home, or online at home, your materials must teach for you and you must build a strong infrastructure on, on the internet or at the home to build kind of a classroom, a makeshift classroom. And that's what's really going to carry your teaching and your learning forward. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Alan, who is going to actually explore with you more about these materials and tools and platforms that you can use to set up your asynchronous learning. Thank you, Jennifer. So I'll now talk about um, using technology for the flip. Um, specifically, I'll talk about platforms or what are known as learning management systems, materials and tools. So to begin, if we look at this image of a classroom, it actually serves as a good metaphor for these concepts. A platform is a learning management system um, and it's kind of like a classroom in that it's a space where students go to to access the course. And then within that space, we have um, the materials. And the materials are things like the video that the teacher is showing and the accompanying worksheets that the teacher is using in the classroom. And then tools are the examples of technology that the teacher is using to facilitate the class. Things like the laptop, the projector, um, the document camera. So I'll go over each of these concepts a little more in detail and give you some ideas about how to set this, um, how to set up effective asynchronous self-study sessions for your students. All right, uh, next slide. All right, so let's talk about uh, platforms or learning management systems. So a platform, like I said, is a virtual space or location. And an effective platform is going to allow you to 
create and assemble web pages, host and guide students to materials, accept assignment submissions, use discussion forums, administer assessments, and provide access to a gradebook. That's quite a lot of functions. If you want to go for a for purchase uh, option, you can choose something like Canvas or Blackboard, um, where you can purchase the web-based technology to do this for you. Um, or if you are more budget conscious and you need to work with free platforms, you can use a Facebook group, for instance, as a type of platform. Overall, what you want to consider with whatever platform you use is, is it available to you and your students? Is it stable? Will it keep your um, students' work and your work secure? Is it flexible? Can you customize it to fit the needs of your course? And is it um, secure to protect your intellectual property? And does it have an element of gradebook transparency? If you're doing um, one of these free platforms, you might look for a free um, gradebook on the web as well. Uh, next slide, please. So here at Embry-Riddle, uh, we use Canvas, uh, like most universities in the US. And this is a very, um, flexible and um, feature heavy um, web-based software out there. And what the biggest benefit that I see in using Canvas for our asynchronous self-study progression is that we as curriculum developers can be very intentional with our curricular progression. So we use a framework to target specific language skills in each of our courses. We also use um, a topical syllabus. So we go over specific aviation topics throughout our course. The nice thing is once you set up this platform, you have a large sense of stability with the course. You can use it time and time again. So in other words, the effort that you put into the course this time gets saved for um, future uses. And as Jennifer mentioned, of course, there are many challenges um, with doing this much pre-planning of a course. You have to um, put in time to intentionally develop that framework for your course. Um, some teachers prefer to build as they go on a platform, which can work, but it takes a lot of time to keep it up to date after each session. Um, and then with any technology, we know that we'll have some um, tech issues between um, students being able to access the course. That's an in inevitable reality. All right, uh, next slide, please. So as I said, we want to use our platform to organize our curricular plan. And then on that platform, we want to give students to access to materials and tools. And I want to break down these concepts a little bit for us. So materials, these are either forms of input, such as videos or audio recordings, but materials are also facilitative or teacher created, things like worksheets or project instructions and rubrics. So we're gonna put materials on the platform and we're gonna use our platform to direct students to tools. And tools are web-based technologies or resources to help you target specific language skills. I'll go over each of these in a little more detail. So with materials, like I said, they're input-based or facilitative. So imagine that for a certain lesson, you want to direct students to a YouTube video. Maybe they'll look at an aviation topic in using special VFR from Embry-Riddle. Maybe they'll study some radio telephony using something like VASA Aviation or Live ATC. What we want to avoid and what we feel very strongly about here at Embry-Riddle is we don't want to say to, to our students, just watch this video. Rather, we want to say, watch this video and participate in this element of active learning while watching that video. For that reason, we often use uh, listening guides to accompany videos, which ask students to engage in a form of structured note-taking that they can either turn in as an assignment or come to a synchronous session with in order to participate. So if we're being creative enough, we can actually use our materials and manage them to have students complete aspects of presentation, practice, and production on their own, or maybe pre-production before they come to a synchronous session for more formal production interactivity. All right, next slide. So 
Now, in a, along with materials, we also want to put tools in the platform. So tools are how we're going to make this language practice a little more interactive. So again, let's think about um, maybe using a YouTube video. How can we make that more interactive? We could have them do a worksheet um, by hand. Or if we want to program something like comprehension questions into the video, we could use an online tool like Visia or a for purchase tool like H5P. This is a form of um, doing the present step by having students engage with a video in an asynchronous way. Maybe you want students to do uh, some pronunciation pronunciation noticing before the course. So maybe you send them to a tool like Uglish where they can compare and contrast how aviation terms are spoken. Now moving into practice, we might have students practice their pronunciation accuracy. And for more open speaking practice, you can send students to a tool like Vocaroo to make a recording and then share the URL um, with, the, with, the um, with the class in the, a group. To move on to production skills, um, you might, or for more formal activities, you might have students use a cam recorder to record themselves on the webcam or have them do a voiceover presentation using Google Slides. Uh, next slide. So to put all this together, um, we, we really want to leverage all the technology we can to do a flip to make the asynchronous self-study sessions as active as possible. So we're gonna use our platform to first set out a deliberate curricular framework um, to achieve the course goals. And then in that platform, we assemble materials and tools that promote um, effective self-study. Remember, we wanna focus on interactivity and active learning. And as we all know, the web-based technologies on the internet um, come out new every day. So as long as we keep our um, minds open to being creative, we can usually find these tools to help us um, practice aviation English without actually even being in a synchronous session. So now I'm going to um, hand it over to my colleague, Gina Lynch, and she's going to talk to you about how to put these ideas into practice. Thank you, Alan. So we've been talking about the flipping the classroom and the various ways, platforms, materials, and tools that can help us do that. Now let's talk about what that can look like in practice. You had some homework to watch the TAM 8078 incident on YouTube. And I'm going to tell you first about a great lesson that we had developed for an in-person course and how we have flipped it to be suitable for an asynchronous online course. Then you'll work in a group to plan your own lesson around this incident. Next slide, please. Our very effective in-person lesson for TAM was discussion-based. One of the reasons that it was so great was that it was adaptive to the students. The teacher could facilitate comprehension, could draw and write on the whiteboard, monitor comprehension, employ think, pair, share whenever needed, and of course, start, stop, and rewind the video as necessary. When we went to flip this lesson to be online and asynchronous, we discovered that we couldn't rely on most of these components anymore. However, we still had the opportunity for students to stop, start, and rewind the video, so we tried to make the most of that. Let me show you how. Next slide, please. As Jennifer and Alan have indicated, in an online asynchronous environment, we have to produce materials that will do a bulk of the teaching for us. I will show examples of these in just a minute, but let me preview some of the substitutions that we made for our online asynchronous lesson. Instead of an interactive teacher-guided discussion, we created graphic organizers and guided note-taking tasks for students to complete as they watched the video. We introduced um, our activities with clear directions and we incorporated timestamps where possible to help students find the information that they needed to complete the activities. Instead of creating visual aids using the whiteboard as we would do in a regular classroom, we actually asked students to draw 
and we included images as part of their listening guides. In the classroom, teachers can monitor comprehension in a number of ways. You can look at your students and kind of see whether they're getting it. But in an asynchronous environment, you have to, you cannot do that. So instead you have to lay out like stepping stones and let students follow that path. So we're not there in the moment to guide them, but to build comprehension, one strategy is the first time they watch the video, they are using, um, they're doing tasks that are simpler, something like sorting, ordering, filling in the blanks. And then later, they'll watch again and answer higher order thinking questions to analyze the incident and explore it in more detail. Finally, in our particular context, video discussion posts were the best option to replace think pair share opportunities. So students would prepare a response to a set of questions about the incident and then post that response and reply to a few other students' responses. Let's take a closer look at a few of these. Next slide, please. In the regular classroom, the teacher can lead students towards important information. On the other hand, when your materials are teaching for you, it's important that you provide upfront a lot more information for your students. Instead of having students to try to identify important events and take notes about them, the teacher has already identified the events in the worksheet and students sort the events, in this case, based on the controller that was talking to TAM8078 um, at the time of that event. By sorting, students are checking their comprehension of the major events as you might do in a regular in-person lesson. Next slide, please. Similarly, to draw students' attention to important language in this radio telephony incident, we made a timeline. We included timestamps on either end of the blue timeline, and we organized those speech boxes so that all of TAM 8078's transmissions are on the top, and all of the ATC transmissions are just below the timeline. Now, this timeline doesn't include every transmission, just we picked out key transmissions that will help students identify important events and possibly language that we would want to come back to in a future lesson. Next slide, please. As for visual aids in the asynchronous lessons, I think Alan alluded to there being many options, and indeed there are. For our context, uh, we found two that made a lot of sense. So we included an airport diagram to build context for some of the comprehension questions related to the airport and the incident. And secondly, we got a little creative here and we asked students to draw something on their worksheet. Having to illustrate the position of that nose gear in this incident is a critical check of students' mental model of what's happening. In other words, if they, if they can't represent somehow visually what's happening to that nose gear, how do we know that they've understood this event. Okay, uh, if this assignment, oh, back up one, thanks. Okay, if this assignment were for a grade, I just wanna mention one tool. Students could submit a photo of their drawing or they could use an online program like Sketchpad to create a drawing online and send that into the teacher. It's just kind of a fun way to, to check comprehension in a different modality, different way. Okay, next please. Okay, the question types, as I mentioned before, are another area where your careful planning as the teacher is absolutely key. Okay, um, you can see in the top box that one of the tasks is for students to simply mark who said what. This exercise brings students' attention to specific language that was used in the incident. And this is something that you could, again, return to in, in another lesson or if you had an opportunity to meet with them synchronously. Later in the listening guide, students are going to build on this and apply their understanding of the incident to analysis of, of the, the incident as a whole, 
which will involve their background knowledge in aviation, critical thinking, as well as the uh, information that they've been gathering in the rest of this listening guide. So organizing question types from simpler to more complex will help students follow that path that you set out for them and build their comprehension as they progress through the activities. Next, please. Okay, so now it's about to get really fun. Are you ready? I've told you about some of our solutions to bring this lesson online, um, online asynchronously, but now it's your turn to plan a lesson. So listen carefully. We are going to put you into small groups in breakout rooms. You will have 25 minutes to complete a task with your group. You will work together to fill out a Google form. On the form, you will see more detailed instructions about your task. To help you work together, choose one person to share their screen in the breakout room and type in the Google form. Your group will fill out just one form uh, with a lesson plan that will include five hours of instruction. Be sure to submit the form when you are finished. Besides planning a lesson, this activity will also give you some hands-on experience using Zoom as a student would. So this is hands-on learning today. All right, the next slide, please. Now I'm going to send the link for the Google form in the Zoom chat. You should have already received this link in an email from late last week. That is the same link that I am sending now. Okay, here it comes into the Zoom chat. Okay, if you aren't sure how to use Zoom chat, you can follow the instructions on the screen. Please open the link in a new tab and we will be sending you to the breakout rooms within the next minute or so. Good luck with your task. See you again soon. Okay guys, so we have uh, muted everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm very sorry for the confusion with the breakout rooms, but I think it's actually a good experience for us to see what might happen. Uh, maybe when you're doing this with your students, just so you're prepared to uh, meet this challenge with a smile and just continue on uh, with your lesson. Uh, I'm gonna let uh, Gina kind of go through and just, we're just gonna hear from a few different people about what happened in their breakout room. So Gina, I'm just gonna let you uh, handle this part. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. So I was able to pop into several groups and I saw a lot of good work. I can also see that many of you were excellent students and submitted your Google Forms. I'm just gonna call on a couple people to report back, what did you plan for the asynchronous time in particular? And um, Cecilia, I was wondering if you could fill us in from your group. Well, thank you, oh, Gina. Hi, everyone. Um, well, the group, um, in our group, we thought about, um, first of all, um, for the asynchronous, the second, I mean, the first class would be synchronous, the first hour. The second, um, we thought of um, some listening uh, comprehension activities, okay? Uh, perhaps we thought of um, also dividing, splitting the video in different parts and, and having comprehension questions for each part in particular. Uh, then we thought of uh, vocabulary, okay? Working with vocabulary like pre-teaching perhaps some words and then working with the vocabulary, especially plain English, lots of plain English from the air traffic controller. Um, and also we thought of including, I think it was the third class, um, some pronunciation practice using some of the apps that you mentioned and, and we would check in uh, this um, English and also the um, uh, plain English app so mm -hmm. that they could practice perhaps minimal pairs. So. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great use of asynchronous time for them to do that self-study pronunciation yes. practice. And would, then... The, the mm -hmm. idea was that 
in the last uh, class, which would be synchronous, then uh, we would do some perhaps uh, remedial work, some more discussion, some role play, but that would be at the end, okay, of all the mm -hmm. asynchronous uh, classes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Cecilia. Oh, wonderful. thank you. And uh, thanks to the group. Yeah, it sounds like they did a wonderful job. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, hey, Neil, would you be willing to share from your group? Unmute. Okay. Um, yeah, we um, went with, we started with asynchronous because we thought it was a good idea to give the students um, some work as a, as a kind of a warmer just to get, to, to, to get into that. Um, I forgot the first part, actually. We kind of went with experienced pilots and ATC, maybe ATC students, depending on their uh, the stage where they are in their training. Um, this kind of example, they may not have had that experience. So certainly with, with experienced pilots and ATC. Um, so we went asynchronous, synchronous, three and four asynchronous and five synchronous. Um, in the first asynchronous, we thought about maybe getting them to watch a similar video so we wouldn't actually give them the material straight away. Mm -hmm. There was a, a good example, similar example with the JetBlue Airbus a few years ago as well. Um, and there's some nice videos online with that so we could give them that. Um, elicit some kind of vocab, maybe elicit some kind of personal experience that they could talk about. Um, if you've got a kind of um, uh, like a, a, a board that you use on your system where they can just write comments, uh, which that would be good. Um, the, the first, um, sorry, the second hour certainly would be discussion from what they've done in the first hour with the, obviously with the teacher there. Then, depending on the experience, maybe just bring in the audio rather than the video, so they can't actually see the language straight and away. Neil, is this is the second hour synchronous or asynchronous? Synchronous. Okay, so it sounds. I, I hate to interrupt you. It sounds no, like no. your your group had a lot, a lot, a lot of good ideas, yes. and putting into practice many of the things that we discussed in this webinar. So, if I can just um, kind of stop there, I do want to share with you guys, uh, with all of you, two things. And the first one is the, the responses from that Google form. So I'll put that into the chat, the Zoom chat again. And so you can go in and see what everybody did. It's going to be kind of uh, massive right now, but could be interesting. And um, Jennifer, if you could show the, the next slide, I'll talk about one idea that Jennifer Allen and I came up with to just show you an example of, of what this five hour could look like. Um, okay, so our first two hours in our plan would focus on comprehension. And the first hour would be asynchronous. Students would start with some kind of vocabulary worksheet and then complete a listening guide while watching the video. And something that came up in, in most groups is the importance of writing clear directions for any asynchronous activity. So that's our recommendation there. The second hour would be a synchronous session in which we would do a jigsaw activity about the TAM incident. So a jigsaw is where you might divide up the TAM incident into, let's say, three parts and you put students into three groups. Group number one studies the first part, group number two, the second part, group number three, the last part. They become experts and then you mix them up so that you have one person from each group who's an expert and they can summarize their part of the video. Um, the third and fourth hours, we thought we would have a language focus. So in, in the third hour, students would complete some type of worksheet to identify instances of paraphrasing from the TAM incident and then read some strategies about paraphrasing. So they're getting, they're getting more of a language orientation this time. And then in the fourth hour, they would be in a synchronous session with breakout rooms to discuss the worksheet that they did at home, um, then recap important strategies with the teacher. And we don't want to say that just because it's uh, synchronous that you have to throw out the teacher. The teacher can still do instructing this way, okay? And then hopefully they would end up 
doing some kind of game, maybe vocabulary, paraphrasing, something like that. And finally, the fifth hour would be an asynchronous assignment uh, for students to make a recording of themselves describing pictures or videos of other landing gear issues. So as Neil was saying, maybe that JetBlue incident, that would be a really good um, accompaniment to this. So this is just one idea. Thank you all for your participation. I wish we could hear from everybody. But uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer to lead the Q&A session. Uh, so just we just have a few minutes left. We didn't want to keep you guys longer than an hour and a half. Um, so if there, if you do have any questions for us, uh, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Uh, further, we will provide you with our email addresses um, at the very end of this presentation. We'd be happy to hear your questions also by email. Um, I do have a few questions here that um, our chat moderator Henry Emery so kindly has sent to me. Uh, so I'll just answer a few of these myself and then I'm gonna ask, I think Gina and Alan to answer a few. Um, one question that we have, I see here is, is it basically like a classroom plus homework? And my answer to you about that is just to kind of consider normally what do you assign for homework? Uh, because typically I think homework is usually something where you would ask your students to practice. And remember that when we showed you previously the PPP, we would believe, we like to believe, and we have seen that you can actually have an asynchronous session for any of those P's. So you can use asynchronous learning to present new information. You can use it for practice and you can also use it for production. So kind of changing our mindset of what we traditionally think of for homework. Uh, this, is kind, this is work that you do at home but it may be for a different reason. Uh, another question that we have, I'm going to direct this one to Alan, is, is there any software available that allows a student working independently to gauge the intelligibility of their utterances? So we might, uh, Alan, if you want, I can go back to your slide for tools, if that's helpful. Any tools that we could use maybe uh, here that might help with intelligibility of pronunciation? Um, out of these tools, um, maybe something as simple as uh, speech notes uh, would work because um, speech notes tries to transcribe what you're saying. Um, it's not going to tell you how intelligible or not you are. It'll just tell you what the computer thinks you're saying. So that's one thing that could be used. Um, I do know that there has been uh, software that's more specific about intelligibility, but I've never seen it for an aviation English context. Um, so that would be something you would have to research. Um, we ourselves, uh, we use a software called um, H5P that is kind of a uh, binary. You're either correct or incorrect with your pronunciation. Thank you, Alan. Uh, guys, I see a lot of other questions in the chat, and I, I really don't want to keep you too much longer. So uh, we will try to address the questions in the chat uh, in, in a different format, and we will uh, provide that information. Um, along with that information, we can also provide you with our slides for today. And um, this session has also been recorded. So I think we may be able to also provide you with the recording. Uh, just to conclude for today, I do want to encourage anyone who is not already a member to please join our association. Um, if you go just there to ikea.aero, uh, you will find information about how to become a member of IKEA. That is absolutely the best way to stay informed about any future webinars that we do, um, as well as hopefully one day our in-person conferences that we are all missing so dearly right now. Um, because we have kind of uncertainty about when we might meet again in person at a conference, we are planning to do more webinars in the future. So we would like to find out what are you interested in learning about? So what I'm gonna do right now is just stop sharing and I'm gonna put up a poll. So if you could just take some time here to just answer this poll question that should now be in front of you. Uh, which of the following IKEA webinar topics would you be most interested in attending for future webinars? 
So just take a few minutes here and respond to this poll. Which topics are you interested in attending in the future? I would like to say all of them. <laughs> we'll remember that. Yes, all of them are great. We should have made an all of the above choice. <laughs> yes, definitely. In my opinion, yes. This is the first time I'm attending an EIKA uh, webinar and I enjoyed it very much. Well, that's it wonderful. Will be extremely helpful for us. Attending, attending to a Tokyo meeting or to Brazil meeting for me will be impossible, while attending to one of those webinars will be fantastic. Yeah, do it that's again. Great. Do it again. Do it again, please. <laughs> I will pay for that a little amount. Okay. <laughs> It's also the first time for me joining an IKEA uh, webinar and it was really nice. It has always been my dream to attend the conference, but um, being online, that was really great. Um, so I'm really looking forward for the next one and thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. So just one more quick thing. So please do vote if you haven't voted yet. And I'm just going to go. We have almost 85%. Okay. So we have your results from this poll. Thank you. We will take that into consideration uh, when we are planning our next webinar. Uh, just to be kind of ex make you excited, we do have one more already planned. That webinar is planned for August 4th. So put that on your calendar. Uh, this will be presented by Henry Emery and some of his colleagues. Uh, so Again, make sure you join IKEA there as I put on the left side of the screen. That's how we will, that's the best way to keep informed about the future webinars. And last is just if you have any questions again or you would like to learn more about what we do at Embry Riddle, um, our aviation English courses, we are very happy to talk to you. Uh, here are all of our email addresses. Um, again, we thank you very much for coming to this webinar.